A critical flaw in the Keynesian model. The central problem with the Keynesian model is that it fails to comprehend the true nature of the production-consumption process. The Keynesian system assumes that the only thing that matters is current demand for final consumer goods. The higher the consumer demand, the better. Despite talk that Keynes is dead, this Keynesian preoccupation with consumer demand is almost universally accepted in the establishment media today. For example, Wall Street monitors retail sales figures to determine the direction of the economy and the markets. They seem to be disappointed if consumers don't spend enough. They act as if they want the Christmas season to last all year. Yet, is consumer spending the cause or the effect of prosperity? If everyone went on a buying spree at the local department store or grocery store, would investment in new products and technology expand? Certainly, investment in consumer goods would expand, but increased expenditures for consumer goods would do little or nothing to construct a bridge, build a hospital, pay for a research program to cure cancer, or provide funds for a new invention. Or a new production process. According to business cycle analysts, retail sales and other measures of current consumer spending are lagging indicators of economic activity. Almost all of the components of the U.S. Commerce Department's index of leading economic indicators are production and investment oriented, e.g., contracts and orders for plant equipment, changes in manufacturing and trade inventories, changes in raw material prices. And the stock market, which represents long-term capital investment. Typically, in a business cycle, the consumption starts declining after the recession has already started. Similarly, consumer spending picks up after the economy begins its recovery stage. This myth of a consumer-driven economy persists in part because of a misunderstanding of national income accounting. The media frequently reports that consumer spending accounts for two thirds of GDP. Recall from Chapter 13 that GDP equals C plus I plus G, and typically in the United States, C equals 66 percent, I equals 14 percent, G equals 20 percent. Therefore, the media concludes that since consumption accounts for approximately two thirds of GDP, the economy must be consumer driven. Not so. GDP is defined as the value of all final goods and services produced in a year. It ignores all intermediate production in the economy at the wholesale, manufacturing, and natural resource stages. If one measures spending at all levels of production, the results are surprisingly different. I have created a national income statistic called Gross Domestic Output (GDO), which measures gross sales at all stages of production. Using this new, broader definition of total spending in the economy, it becomes apparent that consumption represents only about one third of economic activity, and business spending, investment plus goods in process spending, accounts for more than half of the economy. Thus, business investment is far more important than consumer spending in the United States, and in most other nations. The Keynesian macroeconomic model suffers from the defect of oversimplification. It assumes only two stages: consumption and investment, and it assumes that investment is a direct function of current consumption only. If current consumption increases, so will investment, and vice versa. GDP invented by a Russian Keynesian. The inventor of the familiar gross domestic product (GDP), previously known as gross national product (GNP), was Russian economist and Harvard professor Simon Kuznets (1901 to 1985). Kuznets was born in Russia and worked briefly as a statistician for the Bolsheviks before emigrating to the United States in 1922, where he received advanced degrees, including a Ph.D. from Columbia University. His mentor Wesley Mitchell asked him to join the National Bureau of Economic Research (NBER), see Chapter Nine, where he pioneered the basic data on national income and product statistics for the United States and other nations. Before Kuznets, GDP never existed. When Keynes published the general theory in 
Kuznets put empirical flesh on the Keynesian skeleton by creating a new statistic called Gross National Product, GNP, to represent the familiar C plus I plus G formula for total final spending in the economy. GNP, now GDP, adds together all purchases of goods and services by consumers, business, and government during the calendar year. With its emphasis on final spending, what Keynes called effective demand, GDP is essentially a Keynesian statistic. It leaves out all intermediate production. Does G belong in GDP? But there was a problem. The most controversial part of national income and product statistics was the addition of G, government. Should government spending be included in national output? Kuznets seriously entertained the idea of leaving G out entirely from GDP statistics because of the potential distortion of government spending, especially during war. With G left in, GDP grew rapidly during World War II and collapsed down 17% in 1946. It gave the impression that war was good for the economy, and ending war caused a depression instead of a recovery. Clearly something was wrong. In his 1945 NBER publication, National Product in Wartime, Kuznets created a separate national product statistic, with C plus I only. G was left out, and it showed real private sector spending declining slightly during World War II and rising sharply in 1946, a more accurate view of the effects of war and recovery. But ultimately, Kuznets believed in a peacetime concept of GDP, in which most government spending represents a flow of goods to consumers or toward capital formation. So he decided to leave G in the formula for national product, and we have lived with a growing G ever since. In 1971, Kuznets won the Nobel Prize for his pioneering statistical work on national income. How the Economy Really Works William Foster and Waddle Catchings committed this same error. As Hayek pointed out in his critique of the Foster-Catchings debate, investment is actually multi-staged and changes form and structure when interest rates rise or fall. Investment is not simply a function of current demand but of future demand. Both long-term and short-term interest rates influence investment and capital formation. For example, suppose the public decides to save more of their income for a better future, spending for cars, clothing, entertainment, and other forms of current consumption may level off or even fall. But this temporary slowdown in consumption does not cause a broad-based recession. Instead, the increased savings leads to lower interest rates, which encourage businesses, especially in capital goods industries and research and development, to expand operations. Lower interest rates means lower costs. Businesses can now afford to upgrade computers and office equipment, construct new plants and buildings, and expand inventories. Lower interest rates can even reverse the slowdown in car sales by offering cheaper financing to prospective car buyers. Contrary to the dire predictions of the Keynesians, an increase in the propensity to save pays for itself. It does not lead to a recession and poverty for all. Only the structure of production and consumption changes, not the total amount of economic activity. An example, building a bridge. A hypothetical example may be useful in reinforcing the benefits of increased savings. Suppose St. Paul and Minneapolis are separated by a river, and that the only transportation between the two cities is by barge. Travel between the twin cities is expensive and time-consuming. Finally, the city fathers call a meeting and decide to build a bridge. Everyone agrees to cut back on current spending and put their savings to work to build the bridge. In the short run, Retail sales, employment, and profits in local department stores decline. Yet new workers and new investment funds are assigned to the building of the bridge. In the aggregate, there is no reduction in output and employment. Moreover, once the bridge is completed, the Twin Cities benefit immensely from lower travel costs and increased competition between St. Paul and Minneapolis. In the end, the Twin Cities' sacrifice has been transformed into a higher standard of living.